Is it rolling, Bob? All right. Uh, good evening. And welcome to the uh, Overby Center for Southern Journalism and Politics. I'm Overby Fellow R.J. Morgan, and we're delighted to have you join us this evening for our fifth and final program of the spring 2022 semester. Uh, this one being Stories from Possum Town. Uh, we have a panel put together for you here tonight that is going to talk a little bit about the photography of Owen Pruitt. Uh, photographer from Columbus, Mississippi. And what's so unique about his work is that he photographed the uh, town of Columbus, Mississippi for 40 years, from 1920 to 1960. And uh, unlike other photographers of the era, he really went out of his way to engage both white and black members of the community. And so what you have here is a snapshot of America in a very different time, and a snapshot of the South and a snapshot of Mississippi in a very different time. And so we've got a panel here tonight to discuss his work and its uh, historical significance and modern significance. And so I'll introduce our panel briefly. Of course, this work is based uh, on uh, the work that our friend Berkeley Hudson, uh, who has put together a book on this subject. Uh, Berkeley is a University of Mississippi graduate uh, and then was a professor or uh, journalist for the Los Angeles Times and others and then a professor emeritus at the University of Missouri. Uh, he is joined on our panel by our very own Timothy Ivey, who's a University of Mississippi graduate, uh, and his work and his photography has appeared in the New York Times and other publications, uh, and he is also uh, an adjunct professor here at the university currently. Uh, and then our third panel member uh, is Ms. Johnson, uh, Deborah Johnson, who is uh, from originally Omaha, Nebraska, uh, but author of novelist and author of *The Air Between Us*. She currently lives in Columbus and is working on her next novel, and teaches at Stanford University's Continuing Studies Online Writing Program. So, between the three of them, we hope to have a wonderful, engaging discussion here tonight. And as always, afterwards, we hope you'll stay and join us and our panelists for. Uh, generous reception uh, out in the lobby and to continue the conversation that we start in here afterwards. Turn it over to Berkeley. Thank you, RJ. It's a delight to be here. I'm just going to get some of my accoutrements here uh, that uh, I need to get. So, um, this is gonna be like a tapas in some ways, maybe a little buffet. Uh, there's 88,000 negatives and we really, I haven't, they're not all digitized, so fortunately for you, we won't be able to go through all those. Uh, we're just gonna see just a sliver, a selection. And we're also gonna do what I'm doing right now which actually we're good about in Mississippi, and that's slowing down. And that's what I invite you to do, though it's very difficult these days, but we're just gonna slow down, and we're gonna look, and we're gonna slow down some more, and then we're gonna discover what we may discover as individuals and then collectively as and thanks to Tim Ivey and Deborah Johnson, we'll gain some insights that we might not have gained otherwise. But what I want you to know is I'm not interested in telling you what to think because everybody wants to tell us what to think today. I'm just going to tell you, look at these pictures, see what you feel, see what you hear, see what you taste, See what you touch, see what tickles your mind, troubles your mind, tickles your heart, troubles your heart. That's what I suggest. And you have index cards and you can write that word or two on there perhaps, a verb, a noun, an adjective, an adverb, participle, gerund, whatever. But the main thing is to slow down. And I will reference, since we're in Oxford, 
Faulkner's Nobel Prize acceptance speech, The Human Heart in Conflict with Itself. And I think you may see some of that and may feel some of that. So I've been working on this project for about 35 years, or you might say I've been working on it ever since I was born in Columbus, Mississippi. And the other thing that I've discovered is when we are willing to slow down and we are willing to look, it's possible there'll be common ground where we'll meet. No matter what our belief is, or our non-belief, our faith, our non-faith, our political stance, our non-political stance, our gender, our identity, there's a possibility for that to happen. So, this is downtown Columbus. It's a panoramic shot. Pruitt was a large format photographer, bulky cameras. He had a circuit camera. This is about 1927. Downtown Columbus, Methodist Church steeple is there in the east, and the Tom Baby River Bridge is over there in the west. So I entitled it Separate and Sometimes Equal because that's something I've been trying to figure out. We'll talk about some tonight. Pruitt was a white man working in a time of racial segregation. But he moved both in the white and the black community. And there are complications to that. But we'll look at the pictures and we'll talk more about that. Here we are. This is Pruitt in an artesian well. He took my picture from about the time I was a baby to when I was about nine years old. And I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up you to a wealthy also since we're here in Mississippi. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you a set of images now, and I'm not going to say um, anything about it. I'm going to show them to you for a few seconds. I read something in the Wall Street Journal about how people, when they go to art museums, they don't stay more than about five seconds in front of an image sometimes. We'll look at it to a little, we'll look at these images a little more in five seconds, but.
I'm going to play a short video for you now that describes aspects of the project. It's 4 minutes and 44 seconds. The Pruitt images illuminate not only the past, but they illuminate the present in terms of providing a window, a doorway into understanding what we can learn from a highly racially segregated environment in northeast Mississippi in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. These pictures tell an amazing story that goes back in time, and it also comes forward to this very day that I sit here in time. This photographer was not specifically looking at race in America. What he was doing was looking at America. He was looking at a town in the south, in Mississippi. He did not seem to have a, a motive or a thesis. All he was doing was showing life. He obviously had an urge and a desire to make a record. Um, it's, it may not be any different than somebody who wants to go to their diary and write three sentences, but it's a photographic version of that. And I think that, um, that the accretion of doing that over and over and over again in the same place is really the, the genius of it. Viewing race or um, having access to discussions about race um, through this type of collection is um, so valuable because it reminds us that race is actually part of the fabric of the life of this town. The range of emotions and people and places is deeply touching and thankfully Pruitt bore witness to those moments with his camera. To have all of those photographs carefully preserved and now studied and presented as they've been is truly a national treasure. It benefits so much from the commitment of those that acquired the collection to, to really work it, to really put it out there, to, to understand it, but also to share it. It's a partnership between this magnificent photography of Pruitt uh, uh, the amazing archivists who are working on it, and scholars like Berkeley Hudson, who has devoted his life to preserving and to transforming this material, which is part of his heritage as a Mississippian, and sharing it with the world. I'm excited by the potential of this collection to change the perspective of the viewers to allow access to deeper engagement in this issue as not a black people issue, not a people of color issue, but as an American issue. I think anyone who takes the time to just look slowly, look deeply at the Pruitt photographs will be rewarded in ways that it's hard to imagine until you have that experience. It's like, it's like a deer coming up to a, a, a pond of cool water and just drinking deeply from it. And that's what that experience can be like.
So we're going to go back through and look at the pictures. But before we do that, we're just going to have some observations from Tim Ivey and Deborah Johnson. Well, what immediately struck me about these images when I saw them was um, Pruitt's portrayal of black people in Columbus. And I just want to make sure, can everybody hear Tim? No, we cannot hear. I'm sorry. What <laughs> immediately struck me about these images when I first saw them was Pruitt's portrayal of black life in Columbus. Um, usually when we see images of black people, especially in Mississippi at that time, we see them impoverished, uh, even the school systems or conditions or poor conditions. Um, but in Truett's images, I was struck by how he seems to have this respect in portraying black people as dignified and somewhat economically stable in a lot of his images. And that's what immediately struck me with that. Yes. OK. Uh, We're too close. Yeah. Uh, Jack is in the back, and he's working on it, it looks like. Okay. Can you hear me what? now? Nothing? 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 Now? Now? Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll pretend that I'm in class and you're my students. <laughs> okay. So what immediately struck me with these images is uh, Berkeley's seemingly portrayal of his respectful portrayal of black life in Mississippi at that time. Usually when we see images of black life in Mississippi during that period and even now, there seems to be this romanticization of poverty and this, um, especially from white photographers that I've observed, they seem to romanticize, the, I guess based on what they know about the blues, um, they seem to romanticize black culture the way they perceive it. What struck me with Pruitt's work was that he, there seems to be an absence of that. I, I'm really impressed the way he, I don't know if he went out of his way to portray black people as beautiful or capture their beauty or capture their respectfulness, uh, dignity. I don't know if that's something he went out of his way to do or if the, as if the doctor said in the documentary, if he just portrayed life as it was. But that's what immediately struck me from his, with his work, um, primarily. Okay. Thank you. Deborah. I second everything that Tim said. I think I'm the only one on this panel and probably one of the few in the room who's not from the South. And so I came to Mississippi sight unseen, I don't know, 15 years ago. And I was struck by the fact of the intermingling of races just because it was not the way that I was thought that I had been brought up to see Mississippi. I had been brought up to see Mississippi from what had been portrayed to me as a very dangerous place for black people where they were constantly, as Tim said, um, they were, there was no middle class. Everybody was poor, everybody was scared, nobody talked to, I mean, it, just entirely differently from what it has turned out to be. I, was, I had sent a copy of the book to my son in California. He's never, I mean, he's visited me in the South, he didn't grow up here. And he, you know, when he looked at it, he said, well, you know, blacks are over here and whites are over here and women are over here. I mean, he had a sort of standard vision. I said, but at least they're, sometimes at least they're in the same picture, which is something that you didn't often see in 1920s, from the 20s to the 60s in the rest of the United States. If I may add to that, um, one, picture in, in particular, and I'm sure we'll go back and through and see it, is of the, um, the diptych of the black woman in the dress, the fringy dress. I was immediately struck by how, if you notice in the first picture, um, her face is clear. But if you see in the second image, if you look closely, you'll notice a pimple on her forehead and on her jaw. So the fact that he took the time to retouch the image to portray her, at her as her most beautiful to me, that's striking for a white photographer, especially during that time. Right. Yes. OK, so we're, we're going to look at some, some pictures again and just make some observations about them. 
after, oh, <laughs> after I, I make the point about Columbus as a cultural crossroads, this isn't the tip of the iceberg here, but it's a good chunk. And I just got a, uh, I just got an email from a fellow, Robert Ivey, who grew up in Columbus. Uh, he just retired as the CEO of American Institute of Architects. And he had noticed a picture of the, which we're not going to be looking at, of the bellhops, the Gilmer bellhops, all of them black, standing at attention, as it were, before the manager, J.L. Slaughter. And one of those men was Ed Bush, one of those bellhops. And I tell the story in, in the, the Pruitt book about that group of people and about how Ed Bush later and his wife, Jessie Bush, uh, with the help of J.O. Slaughter, renovated the Queen City Hotel, which was one of the few hotels that you would find in the Green Book. The, Green, the Queen City Hotel was a stop-off point for blacks, and they knew they could come there. It was a safe place to go to get lodging, uh, among other things. Um, and, and Robert said, and oh, and I'm not, I need to talk with Robert more about this, but he said Dwight L. Bush is related to Ed Bush, and actually Ed Bush looks like Dwight L. Bush. And by the way, Dwight L. Bush was the ambassador to Morocco under the, in the Obama administration. I just, just got that email night before last. So what I've also begun to see is you just throw a pebble into the water and it starts to ripple out and the Mississippi and the Columbus diaspora is uh, all over the world and it came from all over the world. And then there's all these folks here, and you can dig more deeply into Charles Henri Ford over at the Williams Library and Ruth Ford and so on and so forth, Big Joe, Bucka White, all that. Go ahead. <laughs> so when I look at this image, um, I mean, it's obvious that the, the, the strong white man in the middle, this big fish, uh, is this, the center focus of the of the picture. But I'm still struck by the two black men on the left and the, the black man leaning on the tree on the right. And I, I th in Pruitt's work, as I said, from my observations, I mean, he obviously shows a sense of dignity among black people, but there's still also a sense of infer inferiority in place. Right. And the way the body language, especially for, the man in the front on the left, where he seems to be leaning back, trying not to get in the way. Uh, it's very striking to me. And I don't know, I mean, obviously, again, we don't know the answers to the questions we might have, obviously. But I'm wondering if he seems to me to be obviously trying to not be in the frame. And I'm wondering if he thinks he's not in the frame. I wonder if he ever saw this image and saw that he is in the frame. Right. And it's a great question, did he ever see the image? Um, and I, anyway, I mean, I know things about the picture now, but it, it doesn't add that much to it other than to say I went to school with the white guy's kids okay. and they've just recognized him like six months ago <laughs> when, when they, when they saw the picture in the, in the, in the book or the exhibit, what, you know, a few months ago. Uh, and the other thing, when I say I'm not telling you what to think, I mean, I had this wonderful experience of having Deborah Willis as my mentor, and she's considered like one of the primary um, experts on black photography in America and the world. And she, she was my professor at UNC uh, 22 years ago. And, and she helped me read the images and helped me learn how to think about it, you know, and how to, how to you know, I mean, she taught me with Carrie w Mae Weems and Bell Hooks and all this. But again, what I love is that each one of you can look at this picture and you read it however you want to read it. You know, and, and that, that's what's important to me because then I learn from hearing your readings and then our, our collective readings. Right. Deborah. I have a slightly different take on this than Tim, maybe because I'm not from the South, but to me, they are looking at him, the, the man with the fish, and thinking, he thinks that's a big fish. I mean, just, <laughs> the, way, just the way that they're leaning back and, you know, their hands right. on their hips and stuff like that. That's what, that's what I took from right. it. Right. I mean, when I was a PhD student, I wrote this thing about, you think, uh, 
he thinks he caught all those fish. Right. Right. <laughs> Now, what really, the main question we discussed yesterday that I really mm. had about this image is... Can you hear? The main question I had about this image is, who are these women? Uh, do they work there? Are they customers? And particularly given the history of Woolworth in the South, mm. like, I'm really curious to know who these women are. And you look at them, um, they don't seem to be poor. They're moderately well-dressed. Um, they're, they're taking their time to pose. Um, so yeah, those are the questions I have. And, and again, considering the history of Woolworth in the South, and these are all black women who, who took the time to pose in front of Woolworth, they have an obvious connection, but I'm curious as to what that connection is. Yeah. Yeah, I also was, yeah, I wondered if this was an organization, why these women were associated with Woolworths, and because as Tim said, they're obviously very well dressed, they're posed, right. they're together. It would be nice to know a yeah. little, it would have been nice to know a bit more about them. Right, and uh, you know, this, this picture is, is glass, the glass is broken, it's eight by 10 glass. They're in the collection, there are about 2,000 glass plate negatives that are eight by 10, five by seven, Mostly that's what they are. Uh, those are large format images. Uh, it's, it's really the whole process uh, of making these photographs is, is just you need to be aware how different it, it is from these things right here. And also, I bring this out also to remind you, Pruitt was a large format photographer and he might only make one or two pictures you know, for a lot of different reasons, but he would take a long time to make those pictures. So there's not, not the way we just fire off, you know, 20 images, you know. So there's a thoughtfulness and a meditative thoughtfulness to the process that he and, and a, a lot of other photographers who were using large format cameras were engaged in at that time. And not to add to that, the photography was much more expensive then. Right. Uh, you know, it wasn't go shoot a roll of film the, to take the time to create a glass plate, the emotion on, the emotion on a glass plate was an expensive process, so right. photography itself was an expensive medium. So right. the fact that a lot of, again, what we might traditionally consider as poor black people in Mississippi had their pictures taken uh, right. was, was nothing to be overlooked. So uh, for many of these people, that may have been the first time they were ever photographed also. Uh, that's another thing I've thought a lot about. And, uh, and the good thing about the exhibit that's in Columbus through April 23rd 2 p.m. is when it closes, as <laughs> uh, people are now coming in and telling stories about the pictures and about, you know, well, that's my grandmother or that, you know, one woman came in with a magnifying glass, mm. you know, so. You ready to go, Deborah? I thought that this was uh, a very interesting photograph. And especially because I couldn't quite tell the race of the older man to the left here. Right. And so it, it just, everybody's all dressed up. They're buying things. Just very interesting, I found this to be. Now that I can see it a little bit better, I see that he's probably black. Right. But very interesting. Yeah, especially because it goes against, again, what I always thought of as blacks in Mississippi. Tim? Well, again, to me, this speaks to, it, it kind of shatters stereotypes of, of the economic conditions of black people in Mississippi. Uh, I, again, assume these are the store owners on the left who, again, as Deborah said, I assume are light-skinned black people. Right. Um, the fact that they own a store uh, very seemingly well organized and, and nice store, right. uh, serving black patrons who patrons are well dressed, right. Um, and for Pruitt, the fact again, this is a large format process, which means the exposure was a pretty long exposure, relatively speaking. The fact that he took the time to pose these people in such a dignified way, right. I think, speaks to maybe his his. Uh, reflection or his, his 
how he considered black people. I don't know. Right. And I'll talk a little bit more about that maybe later. I can say the man in the three-piece suit worked at the local black high school as kind of a coordinator for uh, students who were working in, in, you know, internships, as it were, in jobs within the black uh, business community. Okay. Nice juxtaposition. <laughs> we talked about this yesterday that uh, it's just, I don't know why I like this picture so much, but it is the juxtapositioning of it that just got my attention. Very happy little baby, less happy man, you know, as he's, but thoughtful. And, and again, as Tim said, very nicely portrayed. Very nicely portrayed. Right. Yeah, when I first saw this picture, I, I wondered why he chose to juxtapose mm. him like that. After I thought about it a little bit more, um, I thought maybe it wasn't intentional. Maybe he was just trying to save some glass negative. <laughs> no. So, and, and there are, in terms of the glass plates, what they call, you know, split back five by seven negatives, uh, you will see people that you, I mean, that I don't think they were related. I don't think that, you know, right. and so it, it had to do with saving money. Yeah. You know, they only, they only want to pay for one half, you know. And in this case, uh, I, I like that the, uh, the wicker, the chair is the same chair. Whether you're black, you're white, you're rich, you're poor, you get to sit in that chair. Uh, and, and actually, I've gone to the point where I don't identify the person on the right uh, is male or female? I don't know. I can't answer that question. I mean, it's been it, the more I look at it, I just think, okay, well, here's a person here who have, has darker skin than this baby has. Uh, so, all right. So this is the the image I was talking about. This is, I think, the, the one image that struck me the most. Again, not only the fact that he takes the time to portray her beauty, which, you know. Traditionally in America, black beauty is not as respected as the traditional forms of white beauty. Um, so the fact that she took the time to dress up to have her picture taken. But again, what really struck me was the fact that he took the time to retouch her face. Again, you consider photography back then is eight by 10 glass plates. That was an expensive medium. And so it wasn't like Photoshop where you just wave the wand over and make a correction. It, this was a very skilled process to make such a, a uh, re, to retouch the image like that. So I take two things away from that. The fact that either he respected her enough to retouch her picture or that she was economically sound enough to afford that, that service. Right. Which are, st still shatters two stereotypes, traditional stereotypes. Right. And that's my feeling about it too, that we do have, I think, still in the country, the idea of blacks in Mississippi, that they are poor, that, you know, still, this is a prevalent thought when I go out, that it's a very dangerous place and has always been. And she sort of stands against that stereotype. Right. I, yeah, she does, with those feathers, that mm. hand, those hands, so those I eyes. This image is the gift that the pandemic gave me. I never, I, if I were here two years ago, I wouldn't have this picture. Mm -hmm. I was very frustrated by the pandemic in terms of the exhibit that we've created and, and the book. But I just found this picture about a year ago when I got a, ca a, a, a set of digitized images from the UNC library because they wouldn't let me come in the library. And I said, I've got to have more. And this was one of the pictures I found after going through 2000 uh, digital images. And I said, bingo, she needs to go in the book and in the exhibit. Now, I hadn't shown this <laughs> to Tim and, and Deborah before, but anyway. Well, my, my immediate, thought, immediate thought is that I'm assuming this is the same man years apart. Or retouched yeah that's a yeah it's a hell of a retouching job <laughs> <laughs> he is the stereotype to me i mean this is what I, this is what i think of as southern men of that time right. the face the tie 
the right. suit. Okay. They've all got a story. Yeah. Uh, talking about crashing stereotypes, I was very impressed with this image. Now, I, you know what year this is? Uh, I think I say it's like 1928 to 35. Like, you know. So my father was born in Lafayette County in uh, 1926. And growing up, he often told us stories about going to school out in the rural school and coming to, you know, back then they had community schools up to like grade eight or something. And then they came to Oxford to the high school, which was kind of like going to college. And he told us stories about how he, he had an interest in learning electronics. That was his passion. And he told us, story, growing up, I heard stories about how he, the teachers told him that there was, the information that he could give them was limited because all the good books were going to the white schools. Right. So their books weren't up to date. So growing up, my impersonation or my impression of Mississippi, and again, based on the images that I saw, was that the black school system was just impoverished and run down and second class or third class. This image to me just blows all of that out of the water. Um, they're standing there with dignity and pride and order and um, it's masculine grace. Like that, that really, that really impresses me a lot. Yeah, Deborah. Yeah, when I first saw this photograph, I didn't see the girls in the background, so that's good. You said you didn't or you did? I did not. So I thought it was just all, but one of the things, I thought it was just all boys, but one of the things when I first moved to Columbus, everybody black and white told me about was Union Academy mm -hmm. and how they were proud of it and what a good school it had been. Right. So it was opened up in December of 1865, uh, and it had a thousand students by the year 1900. Uh, and there is there it, uh, I reference in the book there was a choir there was a famous choir that was based at Union Academy, um, and uh, again uh, it, studying on it, it is intriguing that the the girls the females are in the back the boys are in the front there's a whole. There's, there's a set of about six of these images, actually, and I can't go into all the details about it. The, the other thing I just want to add, because we are in an academic setting, is Thanks. there's certainly a lot of theories about, about all of these images, and there are certainly a lot of connections with the arts and the humanities and all that, and we really can't go into it all now, and I referenced some of that in the, in the book. Um, so... I'll let Deborah go first. <laughs> we love this photograph. <laughs> we were going through it yesterday because, again, I guess we just like photographs that sort of blow open the stereotype. And there was another one with a church where people who were in that congregation were, you know, sort of photographed in front of it. But I like this one better because it is a family. It's obviously, it's a nice house, a nice family, a patriarch in the middle, very serious. I just like the whole idea of it. Again, because it First, so many ideas of what people have about Mississippi, some of which are correct, let me say. But <laughs> <laughs> so a few weeks ago, I was uh, in conversation with a neighbor some out in the county who's 71 years old, grew up in Mississippi. We just started talking about black history in Mississippi. And he was tell, telling me a story about, or telling me stories about back then, uh, as we know, most of us I think know, black families had a lot of kids to help, you know, they bought land, and they had a lot of kids to help work the land. Um, and he was telling me a story of one man who, he was so successful in his farming that he bought a brand new car. This was like back in the 40s or 50s. And according to the story he told me, like white people were upset, like how could he afford a car? Uh, so there, there are those stories that are around. Um, my family is sort of like that too. We had. My family had like 400 acre, 400 acre land from my, my grandfather bought. But again, if you look the traditional views of black life, I think this is probably particularly true in the Delta where there are a lot of um, 
um, plantations, people seem to think that black people were impoverished and without agency and, and without land or without any kind of economic stability. And this image to me blows away two stereotypes. Uh, the economic soundness of this black family, we assume it's a black family, and the fact that it's a family. You know, the other stereotype I think is probably more prevalent today is that black people don't, black families don't stick together, uh, particularly black men don't stay home and take care of the kids. So the fact that this is, again, we assume is a black the family that's united and sound. Right. So it's the James Mann family, that's their name. It's 1948. Um, and again, I'll reference bell hooks for the theorists out there uh, who has written eloquently about the black family and the role of photographs in the black family. It's nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, white women sitting on a porch, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. When was it taken? Uh, th this is a glass plate, uh, and like I said, I'll go with the late 30s, the, the late 20s, early 30s, but there's a great book called Dressed for the Photographer. It's, it's hundreds of pages that I recommend. And, and I would say this, this and the James Mann family both connect with dress for the photographer. Yeah, I'm going to revert to you because this. <laughs> so th I, um, this is an image that I've looked at for 30 years maybe. Uh, and I still, and I showed it all around Columbus and I never found anybody that knew who was in it. What I do know is that the boy in the center has a bloodied nose. I've looked at it through Photoshop. I've looked at almost every person in there. I've looked at their hands. I've looked at their clothes. Uh, I still don't know who it is. When I showed him to Bill Ferris a long time ago, you know, he said, well, read Ralph Ellison. Read Richard, not right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there is that idea that black kids and white kids were pitted against one another. Uh, for profit and in effect like a cockfight. Uh, mm. But um, it's a, to me it's a very, it's a very haunting image for me. And um, Nobody seems to be upset. No. Uh, I even see, you know, there are a couple of adults or a few adults. Um, but it doesn't seem to be an image that has conflict other than the bl bloody nose. Well, the look on his eyes, though, yeah. uh, he's, not. Is, he's telling us a story with his eyes. He's not happy. As no. Well, you wouldn't be either. And there's a black hand holding a handkerchief over here on the left. Yeah. You know, the automatic thought, I think, is that it is a racial thing, but there's really nothing in the photograph to say that. And the little white boy here and a little black child here both seem to have the same cut off pants. One is longer, one is shorter, but they both seem, but they see, it's just, just a little tie together. So I had the good fortune to study with Joel Williamson at UNC who wrote a book called The Crucible of Race and then A Rage for Order and he talked about the white Southern conservative mentality he identified as a radical, there's a radical mentality, there's a conservative mentality, and then there's a liberal mentality. And the radical, of course, is, would be represented by the Ku Klux Klan. The conservative mentality, he argued, was the long-running mentality and theme throughout Southern history beginning in like 1830 to the present. And then the, the liberal mentality suggested that uh, blacks and whites were equal and uh, and so what's, he also talked about the idea that the rage for racial order could never hold. And he connected that with his work on, on what he called the new people in the 1850s that were a result of uh, essentially rapes of slaves by white slave owners. And, and then he also talked about when, when chaos would happen, and, and what's interesting to me is it's all blacks and whites all mixed in together, very close proximity that, you know, it's the same thing on the cover of the Pruitt book is Catfish Alley and Sapphire. 
Mm. And the same thing is happening. The order does not hold, you know. I noticed, too, the way the uh, taller white boy is looking at him and also the man in the back. Right. I'm wondering, is that a look of admiration? Um, I don't know. But yeah. This is like a Rochor's test for each one of us. <laughs> Tim. <laughs> um, so there are a couple of images here. Uh, I guess this being the first one. You know, I talked about, I was impressed that Pruitt seems to approach his subjects with a, a, a general respect, be that black or white. But when I see images like this, I wonder if that respect to the black community was provisional because he seems to not so much with this picture as with the other one, um, seems to be very comfortable portraying white supremacy. Right. Um, so again, was it, the question I have, was it okay, I respect you as long as you stay in your place, don't get out of line. If you do, then I shift to this other side. Or right, so I'll say Pruitt was a white conservative man. Uh, and I interviewed enough people, including my uncle who worked for him and when my uncle was a teenager, and I interviewed Pruitt's assistants, and I talked more about that in his biography in the book. But he was a conservative white man who loved three things, hunting, fishing, and taking pictures. Mm. And his wife kept up with the books and made sure they had enough, you know. Uh, but uh, we're going to look at another picture of the before the execution of James Keaton, a black man, uh, which I also discuss in the book. Uh, and uh, we're not going to see the image of the lynching of Burt Moore and Dooley Morton. Uh, and that, that, in, that image itself has a whole history that, that goes forward from the moment that Pruitt took it to like shortly thereafter appearing on the front page of the major black newspaper, the Chicago Defender. And then it was on. Uh, the Marvin Gaye special on CNN recently, what's going on. Mm -hmm. And it was also used in the Civil Rights Movement in the Freedom House in Jackson. It was used in the uh, Atlantic City uh, Convention on a placard. It was published in Afro World, Jet, other things. Anyway, but I'm going to need to move us along a little quicker because uh, I'm an all-day talker in terms of Pruitt, and you all may not be all-day listeners. <laughs> so I'm just going to move us on a little bit here. So this is James Keaton, it's 1934. Uh, he was, he was uh, arrested and convict, tried and convicted by all white male jury. Uh, he was convicted of murder of Fred Hazlett. Uh, I used to deliver Widow Hazlett's newspaper, but I never knew why she was a widow until I started to, to investigate these photographs. And a lot of these photographs I investigated before Google, and it took me 10 years of just like reading newspapers and talking to people. And again, this is another one of those pictures that each of us read it, however we read it. Uh, and there's also an image below the gallows that I'm not showing of 19 white men that are around the body of James Keaton. This is also at a time when uh, courthouse, the counties in Mississippi had what, uh, they could choose to have the execution there. After you know, the judge imposes a sentence and then they execute the, the condemned. Um, just, I can't even imagine what's going through his mind. The no. fact he's about to die, but these powerful white men around him force him to pose for his final portrait. All right. Deborah? I think this is one of the most horrifying images I've ever seen of man's inhumanity to man during this, you know, a fairly recent time. Right. It's just that they would pose this man at that moment. Right. So there were baptisms on the Tom Baby River, and uh, there were white church group, black church group, and they came together at the same time. I interviewed my mother about this. She never told me about it until she was in her 80s when I showed her the pictures. Mm -hmm. She said they used to go all the time to watch the baptisms on Sunday afternoons. So 
black church group, white church group. The white church group's in the front, and the black church group is in the back. I was struck by how cranky everybody looked. How <laughs> what? Nobody looked happy. They all looked really cranky. That's the same with the tent revival picture. <laughs> So the black church group is in the front here by the Tom Baby River bridge, Ridge, and the white group is in the back, and there are people looking from the bridge up there. And uh, I acknowledge my National Endowment for Humanities scholar Charles Wilson, an expert on religion in the South, and he's, uh, he's commented on these photographs and the, the actually the, the importance of seeing this and, and complexifying what we understand about what was going on since this image is around the same time also that we have the lynching and the execution and racial segregation and Jim Crow, you know, hold, holding forth. Mm -hmm. So Tim, <laughs> you like this Yeah, one? I was just moved by, again, this juxta juxtaposition. In the book, these images are facing each other, at least uh, the original copies um, we previewed. So I think this speaks, uh, if you want to get back to stereotypes, Mississippi stereotypes, um, the difference in the conditions. But what really impresses me though, the black child, although he seems to be poor, for lack of a better word, the fact that it, he's, they, his family still has the dignity to have his picture taken. Right. He's got a very cool hat on. Yeah. <laughs> Again, it's a nice picture. She's very, he's caught her dignity, I think. Yep. That's the most important. I mean, I love the coat, the hat, every, the ring, but the dignity is what I think he's really captured there. Right. If I knew nothing about this picture, I would think it was captured in Harlem. You think yeah, it was me too. Taken in Harlem? Mm -hmm. I would think it was captured in Harlem. Definitely not Columbus, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. um, again, yeah. If you want to crash stereotypes, this is 1930s. Yeah, so. Yeah, this is a glass plate. Yeah. A dignified, well dressed, beautiful black woman portrayed by a white photographer in Columbus, Mississippi. I think it's just, again. Yeah. Okay. I don't think you can get. I need to check in with the people that police our time. Who, who is that? How, how, what, what does that mean? Five minutes? Okay. <laughs> All right. So we're not going to watch a video that I've got of Sylvester Harris, the black farmer who uh, came into town and uh, he called President Roosevelt on the phone. Sylvester and his brother, they actually owned about 130 acres south of Columbus and uh, weren't able to pay the mortgage payment. And so it had been listening to the fireside chats and came into town, reached the president. President Roosevelt said, I'll help you, and Roosevelt did. And Sylvester went viral in combination with the picture that Pruitt took, which we saw actually in the video, the man with the, the farmer with the mule, Jesse. And then the newsreels came to town. He, the newsreels were played in Times Square. Millions of people heard the story of Sylvester, and there was a photograph that Pruitt took that sort of played a role in that, and then Memphis Minnie wrote a great song, Sylvester and his Mule Blues. <laughs> <laughs> so, we'll see that another time, and uh, know that photographs live forever, perhaps, and that we need to recognize that uh, there's an importance to photographs that Walter Benjamin has taught us about. And the exhibit is here till the 23rd, and here's the book that's available for sale at the back, I think. Who's got questions? Who's got observations? Where are the microphones? Where are the microphones? Here's, oh, there's somebody on, no, here's a microphone. Yes. So I, I'm wondering if, if you've made any connections between Eudora Welty's photographs and Mr. Pruitt's. Oh yeah, I mean, I've studied them. I, I, and also the time period, but I mean, her, her goal was a different goal. He was a commercial studio photographer, unflinching, jack of all trades. Uh, but I mean, I think there's some similarities in certain, certain pictures. I mean, I've got Eudora's picture of the chickens up above my desk, you know, so I'm always thinking about 
what would Eudora think? One of the things I noticed in the photograph of, of the, the men out on the river with the big fish and right. the, the three black men and, the, and the, the white man holding the fish, if you notice, not unlike Eudora Welty's photograph um, with her shadow looking at the ruins of Windsor, you have the shadows of all four men in the water. It's very nice. Yeah, really <laughs> no, The shadows are really, really nice. Yeah, that, yes. yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? A uh, quick story. I was in San Francisco about 10 years ago, and I hailed a cab, and it was an Asian American, Chinese descent, and during the cab ride, he started telling jokes, and he was absolutely hilarious, and I said, where did you get that southern accent from? Where are you from, he says, Benoit, Mississippi. <laughs> I said, I mentioned the name of my college roommate and asked, asked if he knew him. Oh, yeah, I know his brother. <laughs> uh, the photo with the two shopkeepers and the two black men, I'm just guessing there were so many Asian Americans, it, maybe not so many, but it was a significant number in the Mississippi Delta and I'm just guessing that maybe the two storekeepers were of Chinese descent. Okay. <laughs> Everybody has their own readings. <laughs> what? Yeah. So I Call and response. Really, Sparky's yeah. talking. I think it's really neat the way he captures some of the cultural icons like there, Falstaff, and then he had Clapper Girl and right. Woolworth. Right. I think that, that puts everything in a kind of time perspective. Right, and, and for those that study modernity and the expressions of modernity and how they are manifest in the images and the, the garden, uh, the machine in the garden, the southern imaginary and all that, it's all in here. Any other que questions? Questions? Yes, questions. I thought it was interesting, Tim, your reaction to the KKK coming down the street as, as in some possible way indicative of Pruitt's endorsement, I found it cold. This is what's happening in Columbus tonight. And I, very different reactions, you know. You may be right. Uh, it just, it struck me as, look at this, you know. Well, I mean, what I tell my students is, based on our experiences, we can look at the same image and come away with different, different stories, different ideas, based on you know, our history and our experiences. Right. And I would say I've been very, 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 very careful in what I say and what I can tell you that I know about the lynching photographs. I mean, I do know a whole lot, and I've talked to a lot of people, but I can't tell you for sure about certain things. I can't tell you that Pruitt made a lynching postcard. I can tell you he made an image, and he did keep it in a desk, and he did show it to certain white men who came in there. But I can also tell you that his image went out within several days and ended up on the, the front page of the Chicago Defender. And he was, he was putting that out into the world, and so that's a question, too. I mean, he gave it to a, a news agency, so it's, it's complicated. Any other questions? Does the old clock on the wall say this is the end of the Overby Center's uh, symposia for uh, the spring 2022, that time when we finally got out of our homes without, there's not a single mask, maybe one or two that we see. So may we all stay healthy. Uh, do we have some concluding, what? R Richard has a question? <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. Well, you set a good example for us all, Richard. <laughs> Do you all have a concluding, any concluding uh, quick remarks? No? Just. I'm very thankful that you found these images and that you're bringing them to light. That's right. Great. And so I'll just say quickly the line I was thinking when I was running the other day, and it's maybe it's cliche. So 
Uh, to use the vernacular, I wanted to get the hell out of Mississippi after I graduated from Ole Miss, and I did, and I went to New York City, I went to Oregon, then I came back to Mississippi, then I went to Rhode Island, then I went from Rhode Island, I went to Los Angeles, and then from Los Angeles, I went to Chapel Hill, then I went to Missouri. I left Mississippi. Mississippi never left my heart. That's why I did this project. <laughs> <laughs>